Okay. Welcome again to Medell's Experts Online series with today's session on musical ability, stimulating the musical mind. My name is Johanna Boyer and I will be your moderator for today. We will approach music perception and musical ability from two different perspectives, but both perspectives will, I believe, um, demonstrate the potential benefit for cochlear implant recipients. Um, I'm Medell's musicologist and a research associate with our North American Research Laboratory. And I am excited to um, welcome and hear our two expert speakers, Professor Benoit Godet and Bastien Senec, who, will, uh, who I will introduce further in just a minute. But before um, I start, I have just a few tips to share with you. Please name yourself so we can see who you are and um, mute your microphone and phone if applicable and close all other programs so you have the best stable internet connection. And if you'd like to use captioning in English, please click on the closed caption button uh, at the bottom of the screen. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first expert speaker, Professor Benoit Goudet, the Chief of Department and the Cochlear Implant uh, Center at the University Hospital of Rennes in France. He will talk to us about frequency coding and music perception in cochlear implant patients. And before I hand it over to him, I do have a Mentimeter question for you. So please pull out your phones. No. Um, maybe you're aware with Mentimeter. So you can use your phone, the camera of your phone to scan the QR code or you can use the web address with the number code. And then you will see a question that I prepared for you. And I would like you to uh, rate the importance of the following factors for music perception in cochlear implant users in your experience. So for example, we have apical stimulation, place, pitch, match, fine structure information, fitting, and auditory training. And I would like you to rate those factors just as a little introduction before Professor Goudet's presentation. And uh, we have now about 10 uh, participants that voted, we can see that place pitch match is at the very top, uh, followed by fine structure and fitting and auditory training got also high ratings. Um, I think that that's um, some interesting results. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your feedback, for your votes. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Professor Godet. Um, thank you so much for joining us and um, for being available to present to be our expert speaker and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna, to invite me to this, uh, to this meeting and give me the, the opportunity to uh, uh, to present our study on the, the, um, on the music perception. Uh, we know that the main goal of uh, cochlear implants to, to provide a, a good speech understanding in quiet situation and mainly noise so. And we know also that the sound perception with the cochlear implant is poor. The, the, the sound from a cochlear implant for the patient is a, a, a metallic sound like a robot voice and the quality of the music perception is poor. So the question is, is it possible to, to improve the cochlear implant fitting to, to reach a better music perception, but by this way, without modifying 
uh, the speech understanding without degradation of the speech understanding in quiet and in noise situation. So is it possible to, to have a, a different uh, fitting and mainly a different frequency meeting, uh, coding? So uh, when we look at the, the frequency coding in the cochlear, there are two ways to code the um, frequency. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Professor Godet, but um, you have not shared your presentation yet. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we can see you talk and that is wonderful, but uh, okay. you prepared all these slides. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. Yes, we now we can see that something is happening and we can see uh, your slides. So you just have to go into the full presentation mode. I'm doing, okay. So I Perfect. was feeling that there are two ways to, to cut the frequency. The, the most known and the most important is the, is the cochlear tonotopy, which makes the high frequency uh, coded at the, at the base of the cochlea and the, the low frequency at the apex. But there is also the phase locking uh, coding, which makes that the firing rates of the spiral ganglion neurons depends of the acoustic signal and mainly the fine structure signal of the acoustic and the firing rates follow the waves of the acoustic sounds and this fire this phase looking um, uh, fitting um, coding is the second uh, way of fitting of the frequency of the cochlea so a metal developed uh, a fitting based on this uh, uh, fine structure coding which is the 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 FS4 coding. So the first question is, is there a benefit of this fine structure coding in the music perception? This is the third question. The second question is, uh, uh, when we look at a, a patient, an implanted patient, we know that we put uh, the, the, the electrode array inside the cochlea, and then uh, the, the frequency, we will uh, be uh, uh, set at with low frequency at the apex and high frequency at the at the at the basal tone, but these uh, frequencies are allocated uh, uh, automatically, and they did it doesn't depend uh, nor on the anatomy of the patient, neither on the the insertion depth, and th there are many many differences in size of the cochlea and in insertion depth. It means that there is a shift between the natural tonotopy of, uh, of the cochlea and the standard tonotopy and the, and the, and the, 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 the frequency allocated uh, on the plots, the stimulation plot. So the second question is, is there a benefit uh, for frequency map respecting the patient tonotopy depending on the anatomy of the patient with the cochlear length and the insertion depth? To respond to this question, we, uh, we performed uh, two different st uh, studies with the same methodology. This is, uh, we performed prospective randomized crossover double blind study. Uh, it means that we compare two fittings in the first study fitting, uh, two, dif two different fittings with or without the fine structure coding. And on the second, the natural turn to be compared to the standard fitting uh, uh, frequency repetition. And uh, patients were, uh, after implantation, were randomized in two arms. Arms, the first arm A with the first fitting and the other, the, the second one, and the second arm, the reversed. And patients were evaluated after a period of six weeks after the second, uh, second fitting. So there was a, a, a test after the first period of six weeks and then the second period of six weeks. And uh, we performed a multivariate analysis comparing the two fittings, the harm, harm one, A and B, and the period, first period of six weeks and sixth period of six weeks. So we tried to, to find if there were differences between fine structure on not fine, uh, and classical uh, fitting and natural tonotopy and startup fitting. So the Audiometry assessment was performed with a tonal uh, uh, audiometry, speech discrimination in quiet and in noise. 
the music perception was uh, evaluated in, uh, with a multidimensional qualitative assessment. This is the Gabrielson test. Uh, for this test, we presented to the patient two pieces of classical music from Bach and, and Mahler uh, over a period of uh, one, one, one minute and 30 seconds. And the patient had to rate the sound quality on a visual scale uh, in different aspects, the softness, brightness, clarity, fullness, etc., etc. And the, 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 the rate um, was possible with the visual uh, uh, scale, which uh, gave um, uh, an evaluation. We performed also a melodic contour identification test. Uh, the Angelson software uh, presents um, randomly uh, different kinds of contours. And in this test, uh, the, the patient has to, to show on, on the diagram which contour was presented, it was hearing. And we performed this test with complex sounds, with resolved harmonic. It means that uh, between the pitch and harmonics, there were two different electrodes. An unresolved harmonic, it means that the, the pitch of the complex sounds and harmonics of, a, uh, of the complex sounds were uh, coded on the same electron. The third, third test was a questionnaire uh, evaluating the quality of the life in relation to sound, uh, sound quality. Uh, there were 29 uh, items uh, evaluating the quality of life with the telephone, TV, radio, music, etc. And in the last uh, music test was a melodic recognition uh, test. So uh, we asked the patient to choose two pieces of music along 10 pieces, and we had the patient to, to choose um, piece the new world, the melody. The, the, the piece of music were presented uh, twice for 40 seconds. And then we asked the patient to rate the musical recognition on the visual scale. Zero means that he didn't recognize out of the music and uh, 10, he fully recognized uh, the music. So there were, uh, we have a patient to choose two uh, music out of 10, uh, two classical music, uh, two uh, classical jazz, uh, two uh, French, uh, uh, French uh, uh, musics and and uh, and, uh, and also um, uh, uh, pop music. So the results uh, for the first study, first study uh, the, 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 the fine structure study, uh, the study was performed on 19 patients, uh, 20 year, 20 years. So we compare uh, classical uh, fitting HDCS and fine structure uh, coding F FS4. We didn't find any difference in tonal geometry and in speech understanding, we had a fitting effect. The, the, the fine structure was better than the HDCS uh, in a quiet and not in noise. And we had a period effect. Uh, the results during the second period were the better than the, the first period, which is very logical because the patient, the patient has a more hearing experience with the implants. Concerning the quality music perception with the Gabrielson test, uh, we had the better results with uh, the, the fitting effect with FS4, which is uh, clear on the total score, but also on clarity, softness, and nearness, and with also a, a, a period effect. On evaluation on melodic contour identification, we didn't have any differences between uh, fine structure and not fine structure coding. And in the quality of life relation uh, to sound quality, we had the better results on FS4 uh, compared to the classical uh, the conventional uh, uh, fitting. It means that uh, with uh, the, the coding of a fine structure, we have a better uh, quality of life in relation uh, to sound quality. And we had also a, a period effect. So in conclusion to fine structure coding and music perception, um, when we code the fine structure uh, of a sound, we have, well, there is no degradation of tonal geometry and speech understanding. So, and we have also an improvement of qualitative assessment of music perception on clarity, softness, and nearness 
We have no improvement in melodic control identification, and we have an improvement of quality of life in relation to sound quality. On the second st study, we, we studied uh, on the 26 patients uh, the, the natural tenotopy. So we included only patients who hadn't any residual hearing in, in, in lower frequency to, to avoid any bias uh, uh, related to this uh, low frequency. And we included also patients who had a full insertion, uh, insertion uh, death angle uh, more than 540 uh, degrees. For all patients, we performed a postoperative CT scan. We measured the cochlear size. And with the Medel autoimplant so uh, software, we evaluate the spatial position of each electrode. And when with the Greenwood function, we calculated the corresponding frequency bandwidth. So it allowed to have the pitch uh, frequency, the natural pitch frequency for, for each electrode. So we did the same uh, kind of evaluation, randomized uh, crossover double blind study. It means that the evaluator, the tester, and the patient didn't knew which harm it was included in. And after a period of six weeks, we evaluate in the harm A. The first period of six weeks, uh, the patient was fitted with the, the tonotopic uh, fitting, then after the uh, conventional fitting, and the harm B, the reverse. The results here, you have the position of, uh, of, uh, of the electrodes, and you have in blue the convention fitting, and in red the, the pitch calculated with the autoplan software, and you have here the, the mismatch, the, 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 the differences between uh, the two fitting. So the results. Uh, um, in tonal audiometry and in speech understanding in noise, we didn't experience any differences uh, between the two fittings. So we have the same results between the tonotopic fitting and the conventional fitting. In speech understanding in noise, we had uh, significant differences with a better understanding in noise with the tonotopic um, fitting whatever the signal and noise ratio, plus nine, plus six, plus three, plus zero dB, we had the better speech understanding uh, on the speech understanding in noise. Concerning the music perception, whatever the test, we had huge differences with the better results on the Gabrielson uh, test on the, the tonotopic fitting. Uh, on the melodic control identification, a better results with the tonotopic fitting with complex sounds with resolved harmonics and also unresolved harmonics. Very interesting because it means that uh, uh, even if uh, the pitch and the harmonics are on the same electrode, when the pitch is related to the natural position of a tonotopy, we improve the music control uh, identification. And we had a very big difference in the uh, music recognition with the tonotopic fitting. So it's, uh, it means that uh, when the fitting respects the natural tonotopy, there is no degradation of pitch understanding in noise in, in quiet situation. And there is, we improve the speech understanding in noise. So it means that the correct tonotopic position of the pitch of the human voice is probably necessary when the harmonics are masked by noise. And we had a great effect on music perception, on quality of sound, on music contour, and melody recognition. So in conclusion, it's possible to adapt fitting to, allow, uh, to improve music perception without degradation of intelligibility. Uh, this uh, this study showed that there is a great importance of the frequency coding. Low frequency coding by phase looking improved the quality of sound. So we recommend to use the FS4 fitting for patients who, 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 who try to reach a good music perception and respecting the natural centopy of the cochlea 
allows to improve the quality of music perception, melodic contour, and melody recognition. So these, these experiments encourage to propose to all patients a fitting with an adapt, uh, frequency map adapted to the anatomy and the deep inception uh, based on the post-operative CT scan. Thank you very much for your, your, your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Godet, um, for your presentation. Um, I would like now to uh, allow us some time for questions. So um, I would like to ask our participants if you have any questions to type them for now into the chat. And um, we will have more time for questions um, at, at the end of Experts Online, uh, where we have a more open uh, discussion with both of our expert speakers, but I wanted to give some time directly after each presentation. So if you have any questions, please um, type into the chat now. Uh, in the meantime, I'm, as the moderator, have uh, the privilege to ask a question. So Professor Goudet, um, especially with your second study, you showed improvements um, for also speech understanding and noise. And we know from research um, that investigates benefits in mu uh, musicianship or music training in the normal hearing population that uh, there was revealed advantages for, uh, in speech and noise for musicians over non-musicians. Now, have you analyzed specifically if there is a correlation between the results of the music task and the speech and noise task? In other words, did participants that perform better in the musical tasks also perform better in the speech and noise task? We tried, but uh, the, the differences between patients uh, were not that, that big to have conclusion. I really do think that uh, the experience of music perception is important for speech and gain in noise. But in this study, we had not many differences between patients. So uh, clearly, we uh, the patient included were patients uh, who like music, but there was no uh, professional musicians. Okay. So it means that the music, uh, the music's experience along all these patients were more or less equivalent. So it was not possible to to to, to find dif uh, difference in uh, in speech and listening in noise because the the population was too homogeneous. Okay. So but, uh, this, but this this point is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up. Um... Then, uh, because typically in other studies, uh, among all the research participants, we often see huge variability in music tax. So you said in your group of participants, there was not much variability uh, between the uh, participants. The, there were variability in the first one, uh, but in the second one, we are less, we are less. So it was different to find it. To, to, to have any conclusion, uh, and we didn't find it differences in speech understanding depending on the music test uh, results. Okay, and then um, I, I received but, now but some questions. It doesn't mean there is not. It, it means it means the population was too homogeneous on the second step of the study. Okay. okay. Um, I, I received now some questions in the chat, and uh, I was also thinking. Uh, the same. So in the uh, second study you showed, uh, where it is about the tonotopicity and uh, the match, the place pitch match, um, the question here I got from Sabrina Tadeo is uh, if the second study was also performed with the FS4 coding strategy. No, 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 no. no. We did it with HD say yes. Uh, we, we thought that if we use FS4, we could the phase locking, so there is frequency uh, frequency information that can uh, uh, and, and, and it can be a bias in the study. So mm -hmm. probably the best is to have a tonotopic uh, fitting adapted to the natural tonotopy of the patient plus the FS4 study. But in this study, we had four to show that 
the tonotopy organization, the natural tonotopy was important. So for that, we, we excluded patients with a uh, low frequency uh, residual hearing, and uh, 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 it was it was our, our uh, we, we didn't use the FS4 coding to avoid any bias uh, related to the to the phase locking uh, uh, coding at the frequency. Okay, so just to further clarify, so then in that study they used the HDCIS. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you planning to uh, also um, basically put both parts together? Of course, but it's another study. It's another, and it's complex study because it's double blind, randomized. So um, the participation of the patient is uh, at high level. So it's not it's not easy to to perform them every day. You know. So we have to set another an, a, another another experiment. Okay, and I have another question. Did you see a difference depending on the music style? So you had a, a Bach example and a Mahler example. Uh, and uh, if I remember correct, the, uh, the Bach is a very simple arrangement um, with cello, like a single instrument, and the Mahler is more symphonic music. So based on the genre and style, did you see any differences there? No, the, the results on the, on the two pieces of music were more or less the same. And the, on the Gabrielson uh, test, we didn't have any differences between uh, forms and between uh, type of music. Okay, all right. Thank you so yeah, much, it means, Professor. It means, also, it means also that the natural tonopy is efficient, what are the kind of, of music? And we have the same results with the style of music, with the music recognition between uh, classical, jazz, rock and ah, roll, okay. it was the same. Oh, there it's the, the same, so, mm -hmm. okay, I see. Um, all right, thank you so much, Professor Goudet, uh, for your presentation. We will have some more time to ask you more questions at the end. Uh, but for now, I would like to uh, um, introduce our next speaker, uh, our next expert speaker, uh, Bastien Senec, the co-founder and CEO of Meludia. Um, he initially studied music alongside computer science and eventually became an IT engineer. Simultaneously, while working as telecom engineer, he returned to his music studies and worked with Vincent Chantrier, the creator of the Melodia, Melodia method. And that encounter led to the birth of Melodia. Uh, Bastien Senec has been an international spokesperson for Melodia. And if you are interested to hear more uh, from him after today's presentation, then you can find, for example, uh, TED Talks on YouTube. Um, so just search for Bastien Senec. And um, he will present on developing listening skills through music. And before uh, I hand it over to him, I have another mentee question for you to uh, get us all uh, ready for his presentation. So please pull out again your phones and uh, either return to the website if you have it still open or scan the QR code. And um, I would like to uh, know from you, I would like to ask you to list three skills that constitute a musical mind. In, in your opinion, what does it take? What does it take? Which skills to develop a musical mind? Mm. <laughs> um, I will give you some time to think these more open-ended questions. Take some time. It's interesting. Okay, we have here uh, skills like, or I would say core 
components of music such as melody and rhythm, but we also have um, skills like creativity, imagination, uh, and fun and joy and appreciation of the topic that are necessary. So you are entering here quite many skills. Um, so I think what we can see here that it doesn't just take the same three or four skills to develop or constitute a musical mind, but that it depends on many, many things. And um, I think this is a really great start to Bastien's presentation. And I uh, now, Bastien, I would like to hand it over to you. Welcome to Medel's uh, Experts Online. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to talk to our audience. Um, this is definitely a, a more new topic uh, to the cochlear implant field, to our professionals. And I, I'm excited for your presentation. Please take it away. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you to everyone at Medal who enabled this presentation to happen. Uh, and hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to introduce a subject today. Uh, when Joanna said that um, the audience here would be uh, both scientists, but also very, the very diversity of hearing professionals, I was wondering how we could introduce the work we've done and how, how we could give you the most outcomes possible. So uh, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to do this presentation today is to tell you from a pedagogical perspective, uh, having developed a musical tool for music perception for normal hearing users, what did we learn from normal hearing users uh, and how this can inform some studies in the future for cochlear implant users, uh, but also for the field of uh, listening tests and the training of listening. So basically, uh, we're going to challenge some of maybe your beliefs. I hope uh, we will challenge and make you know your beliefs and assumptions move on what normal hearing um, musicians can listen to, cannot listen to, but also what beginners can listen to and not listen to, so that we can transfer them to cochlear implant users. And the second thing is to introduce um, maybe some new possibilities to test the musical perception and, um, and, and with different factors and different questions. And the third thing is how do we build, uh, what do we need, what needs to be true, or what assumptions need to be made to build the rehabilitation uh, processes and research uh, of the future. I hope that's clear and please um, put your questions also in the chat so that I can answer them at the end of this presentation. Um, so basically, just a little bit of background. Um, we, when Jonah said that uh, I, we've built Melodia Lagura 2, there is um, Vincent Chantrier was the first one to think about this, think about the method, it's taking 30 years of his uh, life to do some pedagogical research, to do some training, some one-to-one -one training of more than 3,000 students from um, very beginner musicians to uh, very advanced musicians and to figure out what, was, what were the, making, the missing links, what were the bridges to be built for someone who can't listen to something. And it's important in music to be able to listen to some musical elements, to be able to name them, etc. How do you build the bridges step by step, the micro skills um, in order to create and to develop um, some important musical abilities in terms of uh, listening and perception. Also, interesting factor is that Vincent uh, had a tympanoplasty, so he suffered from hearing loss uh, since he was uh, 17. Um, based on his work, uh, 11 years ago we met and we built a tool which is built on, I mean, there are 625 exercises, more than 1 million sounds um, created by algorithms, um, today, a partnership with Medal and uh, the platform is available on mymedal.com. Uh, so this also gave us very interesting feedback, not only because we had lots of users coming, but also because we could see the patterns of difficulties from different normal hearing users, but also hearing uh, impaired users on the platform, which were 
uh, the, the exercises that were the most difficult, it, it informs us to say, okay, we, that we, there is a missing link here. There is a missing bridge. There needs to be a better progressivity. Um, we did a lot of live tests uh, in, with these tools. So everything I'm going to tell to you about in this presentation is based on more than 250 collective and individual sessions. We worked in music schools, we worked in hospitals, we worked in Alzheimer's disease centers. Uh, so we had a very wide uh, experience of how do we train some musical aspects and not only in musical training. Um, then there was of course the user data that I talked to you, I talked to you about that a little bit before. And finally, uh, there has been two studies to, to, to see the benefit of Melodia practice on, the, on patients with cochlear implants, one made by Charles Lim at uh, UCSF, uh, which is here, and one uh, conducted by Joanna, uh, which, is not, uh, which is submitted for publication, so it's not uh, published yet. Basically, um, I'm going to now just give you the real minimum of what Melodia is so that we can understand and, and I can give you the outcome. Of course, you can use mymedal.com in the future if you want to discover more about the platform, but this will not be the main area. I'm just gonna show you one exercise. Um, here, I'm just showing you that there are different exercises possible. But what I suggest is that we move, if everybody can see that, we move to one exercise, which is one of the first simple exercises of the platform. Uh, at the discovery level, uh, there, is, uh, some, there are some sounds which are called ascending, going higher and higher. Can you hear it? Yes? Good. And descending. Yes, I can hear it, Basta. Thank you, Joanna, just to confirm. Um, the platform is very simple. First, you, you just um, emerge yourself with the sounds. There is a simple question. And uh, then when you're ready, when you have heard some samples, you can push play and then going to be some random sounds being played and you just have to answer ascending or descending. That's descending. That's descending again, etc., etc. I now come back to my presentation. This very very quick example to show you that this is only one exercise out of many, and that in those exercises, there are uh, very small steps of difficulty. Um, among the different sounds, uh, among the different examples of exercises, you have like, how many sounds do you play? Do you play one note or do you play four or five notes? Like many notes or one note? There is, does the sound feel stable or unstable? There are, how many beats do you hear? Like for example, would be three. And you can go from one to eight. And the fifth one from the very easy exercises is, is the second note of a higher pitch or a lower pitch than the So very simple exercises that we created for normal hearing users. And what's the other Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to let you know that you uh, are out of your presentation mode. And Ooh, I just want to make sure maybe you don't want us to see your no notes, so. <laughs> oh, there are no notes, okay. Thank you very much. Oh, I see what you mean. Like this? Thank you, Joanna. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry about that. No worries. But anyway, there was, the, the content was it. Um, Okay, so what we have understood right from the beginning is that it was actually difficult to, um, to ask a question based on sound on internet, not in a lab setting. Um, and it was quite a challenge for um, anybody creating an online test based on auditory training or auditory uh, listening skills um, to, to make a fine question. So the first thing I wanted to tell you, what makes a fine question when, you, when, it talks, when, it, uh, when we talk about uh, auditory training, it's a simple, carefully thought sentence. What I mean by that is it needs to, in, like non-musicians need to be able to understand it, no matter if you did in the past or not. Uh, and that's sometimes a challenge, of course, because the more you use words, the more you talk to the mental, and the less you talk to the listening abilities in a way, and the person has to translate from the mental to the listening abilities. 
so you want your question to be very simple, carefully thought sentence. The second thing is you need some visual elements because at some point, the person is going to have to choose uh, whether it's for a test where it's right or wrong, or uh, whether it is for a training where it's reinforcement learning. Uh, so your visual elements need to be explicit and explicit in terms of auditory objects. They also need to be universal, not too cultural. There is a problem with that. And we've seen some tests um, in, in some scientific studies sometimes uh, for I've just giving you an example, like major would be considered as happy and minor considered as sad. Uh, this is not only cultural, but it's also subjective in a way, whereas major and minor are constructive things. So there are a lot of challenges about that, about what is the right question and how do you ask it? And then finally, something which I guess, if there are, uh, there are some scientists here, uh, is a very costly and difficult challenge is to create an, a number of tailor-made high quality sounds. You know, you need to have the same complexity range for a set of exercises, but you have to have some variety in terms of sounds. If you don't have enough sounds, um, the, the risk is that the person are learning it by heart uh, if they do the exercise again, and they don't develop the skill that needs to be developed. Um, also, of course, like we, we can see on many, um, on many tools on the internet, you need to have some kind of tutorial, you need to have a user experience, which gives the user the desire to understand and to continue working on the platform, all the more if it's about training. And of course, what I was about, talking about, the immersion mode, you need to listen to different samples before you go into the exercise, because you need to trigger already some emotional and sensitive reactions in order to facilitate the learning. Um, then a second chance maybe, and the correction mode maybe, all of the things to make a proper training tool. But once you have that, the results are quite amazing. Um, I wanted to talk about now the, the key factors of success, like what makes, uh, what, what you need to have if you want to, uh, to make a great training tool, if you want to trigger learning and to help the users um, or, or the clients or the patients develop their listening abilities. Uh, first, they need to pass the first exercises very quickly. If you don't do that, what's happening? Like if you ask a very hard question at first, what may happen is that there, there are some mental biases and some psychological uh, constraints that come uh, that will confuse the patient. Um, and we're not sure that the test is going to be okay because actually, um, when you make a, when when you when you trigger some very difficult stimuli at first, uh, you it feels like the patient could answer right but answers wrong because of um, bad uh, because of a bad context. If that makes sense. The second thing is um, you need to have a very progressive uh, stimuli, like starting from a very easy to. To, to more complicated exercises or more complicated stimuli. But at the same time, there needs to be a balance between complexity and simplicity. It, it needs to be a bit challenging, but not too challenging. So that's why the human mind is always uh, kind of a challenge. Uh, and if you want to, to trigger some, tr some training and to, to have the, the, the patient make some progress, you need to go step by step to challenge at some point, but to build, um, in a, in a very steady way. Uh, and finally, we have noticed that the users who were using Meludia more than 20 minutes, um, it, it was triggering some bad side effects. Like for example, they don't want to come back sometimes um, because when you train a patient, it triggers some cognitive load. You don't want to go above this cognitive load. Otherwise the users don't want to come back the following morning or two days afterwards. So there is something like we need to stop when the motivation is at its peak at 15 or 20 minutes, not, before, not after the motivation has dropped and the cognitive load has reached its top. Um, other things that are very important for constructing uh, some training and tests in auditory um, training is um, you need to have some variation, um, but also, you need to be careful with the success rate and the answer time. The answer time gives an information about what's happening in the mind. 
we can see very directly if someone is going to do well or not on, in an exercise, just how long it takes to answer to the first questions. And then of course, there is this idea of endurance, which is, can you answer very quickly three or four or five times in a row? Sometimes the first answers are very short and then they become much longer. Um, and this gives an indication of what's happening in the mind. What are the connections that are here already? What the, are the connections that need to be made? Um, and of course, reinforcement learning enable the client to make those connections step by step. So you can see that the answer time at the beginning of an exercise and at the end of an exercise or when someone comes back on an exercise is actually dropping. And that's a very clear indicator of progress. This means, okay, this skill is good. Now we can go to a more difficult skill. Um, I wanted to finish on some psychological challenges for beginners. Um, maybe you will have found that uh, if it's in your labs or in your, in, in your practice, uh, but uh, there, are, there are some challenges. We are not equal in terms of how do we switch to a state of consciousness based on listening. Uh, some people can do that very easily, but some people can't. Um, and um, I saw the word meditation uh, when Joanna created a question. I think it's really a matter of meditation of like being able to step back and to let an answer come to you. So I imagine sometimes, you know, in an auditory test in a laboratory with the context of being there, just the ability to switch off and to switch to a state of consciousness based on listening is a challenge for some people and needs to be taken into consideration. Then we talked about that, but the, develop, the, the mental agility and resilience, when some people make some mistakes, they feel very bad about that and they just stop. Uh, I mean, their mental processes can't go on they can't get over it. It's difficult for them and they need some time to recover from a mistake. Um, so these also need to be trained when training the listening skills. It's absolutely connected. Um, another thing connected to that is softening self-judgment. What do you think about yourself when you make a mistake? And we've seen that for beginners, we've seen that for musicians. Um, the idea that I don't know, I don't really know why, but when you make a mistake in a listening exercise, it feels like it touches something intimate, something uh, related to self-esteem, related to self-judgment. Um, and this needs to be softened. And this is, of course, some psychological things that we can't uh, really uh, control remotely. Um, and finally, creating some routines, developing intrinsic motivation. How do you make people understand that um, training their auditory abilities is going to change the way they perceive the world uh, all the more when they have uh, some hearing impairments is a challenge and needs to be, needs to be addressed. Um, now, just to give you some other, I don't know how long I have, Joanna, if, uh, I've consumed already all the time, or if I still have five minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, you have a couple more minutes, but I also would still like us to have time for questions. Wonderful. So I'm going to take two minutes to finish this presentation. Yeah. And there are some, so we have created some, on top of the beginner exercise that I've shown you earlier, we've had some intermediate exercises. We have some advanced exercises. We have some expert exercises. And in this end of the presentation, I want to talk to you about musicians and what we believe about musicians and what is true or not about musicians. Um, first, uh, I will say, I will read this sentence because I think it's so important. Within any music class, in any music school in the world, um, maybe you can remove the Curtis Institute of Music and a few very high level inst uh, music institutions in the world, but the students' general level in listening abilities is very heterogeneous and it's much lower than we can imagine. It's, it means like the listening abilities are not something that is being really worked on. Um, quite simple musical objects with only two notes or three notes. So imagine I just played two notes on the piano or three notes on the piano, and I would ask you some questions about those notes, trying to recognize them, trying to recognize the color or where they are. It's already very difficult even for music students even after five, more than five years of study. So what I mean by that, um, I mean, I think most of you know that there is a synthetical 
listening abilities and there are analytical and emotional uh, listening abilities. And the synthetical is when I hear a piece of music, I have this representation inside of me to have, okay, I can hear the Mozart, I can hear the Justin Bieber or whatever. But when I start to go into the very uh, low, uh, like, like the very specific aspect of music, being able to know that it's a major chord, that it's going up and down or flat, etc., is something that is much more complicated for the mind. And that's something that we don't train for. Like we don't train our mind for that. But of course, it's possible to train it. And of course, it fits the synthetical um, perception of music. So we have um, classified the listening abilities in seven categories, which you can see here. Uh, it's interesting to see that you, as a musician, you really need to work to make the most progress. That the one you're not the good, the, 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 you're not the best at. And of course, as humans, we always work on our strength, not on our weaknesses. This is actually the tendency. So we have to make them come back to that. Um, and also interesting enough, the most talented musicians, the most uh, have um, nearly always the most developed and consistent listening abilities. So they are good everywhere. They have, or, or they are average everywhere. And this is a sign of, uh, of, of good development. Now, of course, there are some psychological challenges for musicians as well. Um, it feels like the mind always prefers the visual than the listening and tries to go over the listening abilities. So musicians rely, some, most musicians rely on the score or instrument technique more than the listening abilities, which is interesting for, uh, for an, auditor, an auditory uh, stimuli like music. Um, then um, there are lots of um, limiting beliefs that I wanted to talk about. Um, listening abilities can't be improved. A lot of musicians, like, they really believe that, which is not true, of course. You need to have perfect pitch. All of those things come and give a galaxy of different beliefs, different values, which prevent their brain actually to work on those listening abilities, which will inform uh, all of their musical practice. Um, and of course, self-judgment, motivation, resilience are uh, something that are difficult to trigger um, when you create a test or a training tool. Um, okay, so I try to go as fast as I could to cover all of the subjects that I wanted to talk to you about uh, today, but please um, ask questions and I hope we can, uh, we can be in touch in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bastien, uh, so much for your presentation. And um, we will go into your questions um, in a minute, I would like, before we though do, uh, I would like to ask the audience to uh, switch on their videos uh, because it's time for our group picture in order, you know, to create a memory of all of us, um, the audience, the speakers, and um, then we also can keep the video on for our questions and that you're having. So I, I can see several people have their uh, video on. So I'm just going to count down and then my colleague will take the pictures for us. So are you ready? All right, let's do it in three, two, one, cheers. Okay, thank you so much. And let's go uh, and move on to questions um, that you have for Bastien. Let's maybe um, give, give some questions to Bastien first and then I overall want to uh, open up this discussion so that you can ask questions to both of our expert speakers. You can either type a question or you can also now unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. And um, until I receive a question, I think I will simply ask a question as the moderator. Uh, Bastien, you were talking at the very end about uh, musicians and the beliefs of what they uh, should be able to do. 
I think in cochlear implant research, of course, we are testing probably much more simple tasks than what you had in mind. And typically compare cochlear implant users to normal hearing individuals where normal hearing individuals, um, you know, we receive ceiling effects of uh, all the tasks and uh, cochlear implant users do more poorly in the pitch related and timbre related tasks. Um, but what I got from your presentation is that music is even challenging, li listening related music tasks are even challenging to musicians. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, um, thank you, Joanna. Um, the, the, the two things about that. First, when we saw the first studies for cochlear implant users, we were very uh, interested to see because uh, the, the stimuli, the auditory stimuli looked very complicated compared to what we proposed for some beginners in, in Melodia. Um, because what Vincent discovered for the 30 years is that actually, even if you're a normal hearing individual playing music for a few years, you have some listening problems. When I say listening problems, it doesn't mean that your cochlea is damaged and that the signal doesn't come to your brain. It means that as a musician, you need to have some abilities connected to how do you represent music within yourself? What, like, what does a musician, can, what can a musician listen to when he's listening to music compared to a non-musician, you know? And those things are underdeveloped. It's mm -hmm. so much underdeveloped based on what we can imagine. I remember being, for example, in a conservatory and having some, um, some, some teachers having some problems with major and minor. And maybe for non-musicians, major and minor don't seem, um, don't seem a bit abstract, but it's like the colors of music. It's like you would ask a painter, oh, like, do you know red and blue? You know, do you know, can you make the difference between red and blue? But for auditory, because there is the, you know, the visual print, when you see a painting, for example, the information stays, it's permanent. So it's, it feels like the brain is able to make the connections between that. But for auditory, for listening abilities, it's not the case. You listen to something and it disappears. So it's like, if you don't, between zero and five years old, if you don't have the stimuli, the musical stimuli, it's very complicated in a way for the brain to reconstruct them afterwards. So of course you can do it, but you need to breathe to give the, more, the, get the, the best stimuli. Mm -hmm. And we're very interested to see what will be the future of uh, cochlear implant rehabilitation. Where can we bring them if we give them the right stimuli and the right questions? Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of to uh, follow up on that, um, and you mentioned earlier this emerging mode, um, you know, based on, on my experience um, evaluating Meludia with cochlear implant users, I was surprised that some of the harmony related, very complex tasks that yes, they failed at the beginning at the very first trial, but if they, if you give them some, some time and repetition and by um, exploring the sounds that they are actually able then not just to differentiate those sounds, but also to label them and identify them. And, um, you know, after the study I'd done, I showed Melodia to some of my colleagues, although normal hearing um, individuals who also found those exercises difficult. Um, so I see a parallel between normal hearing individuals and cochlear implant users that with certain complex musical tasks like harmony, uh, that it is a lot about exploring the sound and also getting a certain question asked for the first time. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's about which question you ask mm -hmm. and is it easy enough? And then what are the, what are the successive pathways to go to something that, to, to go to the, to the skill that you want them to develop? Mm -hmm. Exactly that. And we always overestimate normal hearing users when we are in the hearing impairment world, and we underestimate the, the, the hearing impaired in my experience. It's just my experience as a pedagogue. I have two questions in the chat. So um, let me start with the more simple one. The question is, can these trainings be done through direct streaming or through an external audio source? So um, Meludia and Medel are collaborating and we are currently launching Meludia on my Medel. So um, in the future, 
in our priority are Medel users um, to offer them music training, but we will also make Melodia available to all our professionals. So please stay tuned for more information in the future, and you will be able to uh, uh, access Melodia on my Medel. Um, and then we had a question from uh, Ethel Ruth. Uh, what kind of music do you recommend to play at speech and language therapy? Do you Good have? Question. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I will try to be quick on this one. Um, I would recommend, like, I think there is 80% of the, what the patients like and 20% of trying to stretch. Like, like um, what I think we should do with children when they, when they learn music. It's going to pleasure, their own pleasure, what they want to listen to, and then trying to stretch sometimes. Um, but of course, there is, as I said, there is also a dichotomy between synthetical, what I call synthetical listening. It's like listen to the old sound, just be passive and just try to see what it makes. And if it triggers emotions and everything, that's all, you, don't, you have nothing to do. And then having a more active uh, stimulation through some listening exercises, and those you can find on Maludia, but also you can do with a piano, everything. Um, I have another question for Professor Godet. Um, if you would unmute yourself again. Um, the question in chat is asking, um, or at first there's a comment, everything depends on the map. In my experience, the difference in speech understanding is 20% to 80% between a good and a bad map. Did you match the map of the patient with the measurement of tone threshold? No, not tone threshold, not tonal audiometry, but speech understanding, yes, but not tonal audiometry. We didn't have any differences between the two fittings. Okay. Okay, and uh, Dirk, you could also unmute yourself if you want any further clarification, if uh, to make sure we understood or Professor Bode understood your question. Did he answer it, or I can see you? Yes, it's it's clear. I uh, I understand uh, the, the answer, uh, but I, uh, in my opinion it's uh, always the problem of uh, uh, to have a good map, to have a good audiologist. And uh, I had sometimes really bad uh, uh, maps on the patient. And with one fitting, I, uh, uh, the patient came from 20 to 80% of speech understanding. And uh, uh, that's a problem of all these uh, uh, measurements uh, that the maps are not consistent uh, uh, for the best map. That's, a, that's a, the most problem on the uh, fitting. Yeah. And so for your study, Professor Goodday, um, did one audiologist or clinician uh, arrange all the maps for all participants? Yes, all the maps were... Uh, I, I didn't uh, describe all the details, but uh, the, the measurements of uh, the position of Hodge, each electrode were performed by two uh, ENT surgeons, and the map was all the map was set with the same uh, audiologist. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at least you know account for that factor. Yes. And uh, uh, we have we have frequency uh, compression on high on high frequencies. Um, I didn't tell all, all the detail, but uh, for example, it's it's really impossible to to set the exactly pitch of all electrodes. For example, we should have uh, electrodes at, uh, at uh, 50,000 hertz, 20,000 hertz, so there is no sense for a cochlear implant fitting. So we had a compression over the level of 300 hertz, and uh, um, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a question earlier from a participant about if basically the data of your uh, studies, if they are available um, nowadays, um, more and more researchers are sharing like the uh, details of the protocol the are, and the data. All the data are under publication, so I, I hope uh, they will be available for all of, of you when it will be published. That's, it's under publication. Okay. But if they are not, I, I can't give you right now. Okay.
Okay, yes, um, if you would maybe share it in the chat, that would be wonderful. To share the data? Uh, no, 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 not the data, but the publication. Oh, yes, yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. If, if you have a link, maybe. Uh, it's not published right now. It's oh, okay, I misunderstood. Okay, well, then we are looking forward to the publications. <laughs> and um, It depends on the viewer, not, it depends not on me. <laughs> I thought, okay, I thought that when you said you could share it, you meant yeah, now, yeah. but I think you meant in the future. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are already six minutes over, and uh, I would like at the very end now just to uh, uh, share with you the uh, information about the next Experts Online session about genetics and hearing loss which will be taking place on November 3rd. So if this is a topic that interests you, um, then you will receive more information if you've signed up um, or you can make a note and we will see you back. Thank you again to both um, expert speakers, Professor Godet and Bastien Senec. Thank you so much for taking the time for preparing and sharing your work. Um, and um, thank you all. Thank you to the audience for taking time and joining us. And we will see you another time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>